This is all theater. This is all just political theater. Political theater. Political theater. Pure political theater. Theater. Political theater. The nefarious, significant, and protracted political, political, political theater for political theater's sake. I yield back. From Washington, this is Political Theater. Roll Call's review of the spectacle of politics on Capitol Hill and across the country. I'm Jason Day. People feel so passionately about food that perhaps it is not a surprise it has yielded that rarest of things, a sequel to a documentary. The makers of 2008's Food, Inc. are, as their new movie's tagline goes, back for seconds with Food, Inc. 2. It's a multi-layered look at the food industry, its farmers, workers, scientists, journalists, and more. There is a lot to chew on in this film, and the co-directors, Robert Kenner and Melissa Robledo, are here to talk about it. From soup to nuts, Robert, Melissa, welcome, and please forgive all the terrible puns. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> Glad to be here. Thanks, So... The, I, I know you have uh, you have have sort of answered some of these questions uh, a lot, but just for the purposes of our audience, just talk a little bit about uh, how how we got from 2008 and very successful uh, sort of I- iconic documentary, uh, you know, uh, of, of Food Inc. to 2024 uh, and 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 Food Inc. Two. Well. Food Inc. 1, we basically were taking a look behind the veil to see how our food was made. At that time, it was a relatively new uh, look into the food industry. We really hadn't uh, thought about where our food came from as much at that point. Um, And I think between our film and Michael Pollan's book and Eric Schlosser's book and many other movies and many other books, uh, that people became very interested and it sparked lots of, um, you know, people starting to buy much more with their conscience and much more with their values uh, and CSAs exploded and farmers markets exploded and um, all of the uh, healthy food options at the super, supermarket grew. Uh, and we felt uh, perhaps naively that we'd done our job and we were going to move on to the next subjects of which we've done a number of other films. And, um, you know, and as documentarians, it's always great to enter a new world and uh, learn about it and move on to a new subject. Uh, So it never occurred to us that we'd be starting uh, looking to do a sequel. But then when the pandemic hit, we kind of... um, it sort of crystallized so many things that had gotten that much worse in the food world since we had made the first film. Uh, You know, we saw what was happening in the the meat packing plants in the United States where workers were being called indispensable, you know, uh, essential, uh, essential workers uh, and being denied unemployment. So they had to go into these very dangerous working conditions or farm workers were going, uh, being told they couldn't be tested for COVID, um, you know, because they didn't want to slow up the tomato harvest. And that's what sort of brought us back into this world. Um, Maybe I'll I'll stop there, but it sort of led us to many other stories that we tell in the film. And and uh, you, you mentioned Michael Pollan and Eric Schlosser. They were a big part of Food Inc. Uh, and of course, for anybody who is, you know, follows uh, food food journalism, uh, food exposés, uh, they're they're familiar with, you know, Pollan's uh, food rules or or the omnivores d- dilemma or Schlosser's fast food nation. Uh, did uh, did you keep in touch with them over the years? Uh, I mean, I know that you know some. The documentary filmmaking world is is a small one, but uh, you know, Pollen and Schlosser have their own projects. Did did you retain that relationship with them? Because in the in Food Inc. too, it seems like there is a there's a familiarity there that is hard to hard to fake. You know, they, they seem very kind of at home talking to you all uh, in the course of the movie. Well, we did a project with Eric, Command and Control, uh, about an accident in a nuclear missile silo. Mm -hmm. Uh, We talked to Michael about doing projects. Uh, So we've been totally in touch. And and projects we did without them, um, they were advisors for us as, as friends. So, you know, we've become very close and it's been a wonderful relationship. Uh, though 
I think all four of us equally thought we would never enter this realm again. Uh, so. Though interestingly, um, at the outset of the pandemic, Robbie and I were working on short pieces uh, for the New York Times op docs about mm-hmm. workers. And at the same time, Eric and Michael separately had written um, op-eds or uh, articles uh, that were published within the same week. And it was kind of a moment where we all came together and thought, maybe this is the time to revisit things. (laughs) We all shook our heads and said, I can't believe this, but maybe we should be making this film. Yeah. And, and it, it is a, you know, it's, you know, the, like, like most documentaries, you know, that are, that are well edited as this one is, I mean, this one kind of goes by fast. It's 94 minutes, you know, uh, but there is a lot there. There's a lot of, it is, it, it touches on every link in the food chain. Um, and, you know, it's, it is kind of rare to have, I mean, I know that there are a lot of characters in, in a lot of people that you, you, you discuss and a lot, a lot of people will talk to and we'll get to some of the events you did, uh, including a screening, uh, the previous evening to this podcast, uh, at the Burke theater at the Navy Memorial. Uh, but it seems like Pollen and Schlosser are almost like your, your, your Virgils for this, uh, tour, uh, if, if you will. Uh, and there are hellish parts of this tour. Uh, we were, you know, I think the four of us were in sync, not to say we didn't have our moments where we went at each other, uh, but it's all, um, you know, sort of like a family relationship. And uh, and we end, you know, we on tour in Washington last night, and it's yeah. like great to all be together. And, and it's great to be with our, uh, many of the people who were in the film that we just met on this film, but uh, you really develop close relationships with each other, including both senators. Uh, yes. They've been yeah, I was going to get to the some of the events. So, so I mean, uh, Senator Cory Booker, Democrat from New Jersey, and Senator John Tester, uh, Democrat from Montana, are subjects in your film. Uh, Tester, of course, is a farmer. So that's kind of a, a, a you know, fit, fits right in uh, with, with the chain and, and Booker, uh, you know, is former mayor of, of Newark. Uh, and, and that you, you make, you, you show the relationship between these two men, not just as colleagues in the Senate, but on, on, on both sides of the food equation where, you know, food, you know, like that starts out in places like Montana, like eventually finds its way to places, you know, that are, are, you know, need food <laughs> like, like Newark. And, and they, and Booker, you know, is, is, I mean, everybody is very passionate in this movie. Booker may be plussed up uh, in that, uh, in in his advocacy for fresh food and getting better food to vulnerable communities, uh, like like some of the ones that he has has been around all of his life in Newark. Uh, what was it like bringing those two together? Who did you approach first in that in that uh, in that world? Well, we approached uh, Senator Booker first, and then we were uh, shooting in his office, and we said, uh, Eric Schlosser and Michael Pollan said, wouldn't it be great if you could get Senator Tester as well? And what's so exciting about the two of them together is they really sort of show what's wrong or capable of expressing what's wrong with this food system um, in that, uh, you know, in terms of so much of the way we look at the farm bill has always come out of rural America and it's had nothing to do with urban America uh, other than they get the surplus sort of crappy food goes into the cities. Uh, And, you know, Tester speaks to the fact that rural America has become hollowed out uh, by corporate, you know, the corporatization of farming uh, and that so many of his neighbors and his towns have just been hollowed out. Uh, And Booker represents the, you know, the product that this corporate food that is being made, uh, this consolidated, um, food uh, that gets into the cities is nutritional, nutritionally bankrupt food uh, that's making people sick. So in a way, that relationship is a new relationship that didn't exist in 2008. Um, there were really there was no one in the Senate at that point advocating for good food when we made the first film. There were people in the House that were uh, that were doing a wonderful job, but that was not true of the Senate. Uh, and now 
those two have come together and know as much as Eric or Michael about what's going on in this world and can speak very passionately and very knowledgeably. Yeah, and it, it does seem that the, you know, where we were in 2008 to where we are now is just this huge sea change and, and that people do respond. I mean, even though we are overloaded with crap food, uh, that, that uh, you know, sort of from a marketing perspective, you know, in, in my own workplace, you know, there's a there's a bunch of nutritionally bankrupt snacks <laughs> you know, downstairs, you know, just waiting for people, you know, who need a, a quick hit at four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, for, you know, that but um, but people respond also to wanting fresh food, you know, whether it's kids, you know, in, like you, you've got this great scene in Camden, New Jersey, where the school district works with local farmers in Jersey, you know, to bring fresh foods and vegetables. You see kids eating kale, you know, and, and, and things like that um, or, or toward a farmer, farmer's markets. I mean, my I'm, I'm also from the rural West. I, I had a bonding moment with uh, Senator Tester about this last night uh, at, at the screening because, I mean, I grew up on a very small cattle ranch in Cottonwood, excuse me, Cottonwood, Arizona. And most of that, most of the farmers and ranchers uh, in, in that area, there was either lettuce or cattle uh, have sold, you know, their land off to land developers. But like Tester, the people who have remained have adapted a little bit and they are growing grapes now for wine. And so there is this adaptation and this desire to a- adapt that just didn't seem like it was even a part of the conversation before, you know, the early 2000s. It definitely seems like there's a uh, hunger on the part of consumers for different options. There is an adaptability, like you're saying, and innovation coming from farmers and Um, But what happens is when we don't have a level playing field, there's not room for that innovation to flourish, right? That we have so much consolidation without competition, we are not seeing enough of that, those opportunities or or a, um, you know, innovators, their, their, their best option is to sell off to a large corporation. And so, um, there definitely is an interest in, on the part of consumers, and I would say, in terms of um, in terms of their interest, we do talk about ultra processed food in this film, which is a new, uh, you know, it's some it's a new concept. I think to the public, it's it's been uh, there's been a lot of research around ultra processed foods for the last say 15 years. Uh, it was, began after the original film, and um, this is a an area of that's. I think consumers will be more and more focused on, and I think we uh, labeling our foods as ultra processed is something we hope to see in the future. It's really a totally new development since we made our last film. It's a new concept, even though the food was around, uh, you know, but in the first film, we talk about the nutrients of sugar, salt, and fat being a problem that exploded the diabetes uh, problem in the United States or crisis in the United States. Uh, but we've begun to realize uh, through testing, well, Car- Carlos Montero in Brazil was the first one to coin the phrase ultra processed. Uh, subject and, in your film also. Yeah, yeah, a subject in the film. And, uh, and he, uh, Kevin Hall, a researcher at uh, NIH, uh, thought that Carlos was wrong, uh, that Carlos was saying it's something about the actual ultra processing that is also making us sick separate of the nutrients. Uh, And Kevin thought it was purely the nutrients. um, And he went on to do testing uh, of combining two meals, one that's processed but contains the same amount of sugar, salt, and fat. and then one that is ultra processed again with identical sugar, salt, and fat. And the results were that people were eating the ultra processed uh, food were eating 500 calories more per day. And as Marion Nessel, another subject in the film who's uh, uh, been involved in the nutritional field for decades. decades. <laughs> <laughs> no. we, we had her for a roll call book club once. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, she's great. And uh, she said, this is unheard of 500 calories. She said, occasionally, you'll get 50 calories difference 
um, you know, per day. And that would be extreme. So 500 calories is unheard of. Uh, and there's, so there's something about the actual act of ultra processing uh, that is changing how we eat because it's almost an addictive and some would say an addictive form uh, that it just makes you keep wanting to eat more and more of this food and it's making us sick. There's been reports of 52 diseases that are associated with this. Uh, it's not totally been quantified as exactly what is ultra processed, but our definition in the film is uh, made with chemicals you don't have at home and machines you don't have at home. Uh, so, yeah, I, I was, I was struck. And, and again, I, I thought to all those like late afternoon, uh, like snack, snack runs, uh, of, of my own, you know, when I, you know, when I'm like with it together enough and, uh, and, and bring something like, uh, you know, some, some almonds or cashews, uh, I get sated pretty quickly. Uh, if if I reach for Doritos or Pringles or or something like that, uh, it's it's like one to, one is too many and a thousand is not enough. Uh, it, it's, really, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's really hard to say no to it. And I and I mean part of it is that it tastes good, but it, it seems like there's something uh, you know manic about it almost. Mm -hmm. um, so. and, and what's shocking is that we are consuming about two thirds of our calories in the United States comes from ultra processed food and it's rewiring our brain. Um, and uh, one of the things we took out of the film was a study that a scientist who had been studying heroin addiction went on to look at these foods and was working with rats and just showing you how they become addicted. Uh, and it was like terrifying that we ended up taking that piece out. We kind of cover that in other ways in the film already. Yeah. And, and one of the, you know, the chief, you know, themes that you keep coming back to in the film. And, and again, it, it is, you know, you're, you're in Brazil, you're in the, you know, the coast of Connecticut, Montana, you know, it, uh, it's a, it is a sprawling, it's a, it's a 94 minute epic, if you will. Uh, <laughs> And uh, but but you keep coming back to this idea that the, the consolidation of the food industry uh, and particularly the United States government's subsidizing of of commodity crops for that consolidated food industry is where we have. This is what's different. This is what has changed the landscape literally uh, and changed our diets and now is changing our brains even uh, is, is this. And one of the things that, you know, uh, that the, during the Q&A last night uh, that, that Tester and Booker particularly uh, hit on was that this, if, if, you, if you continue to poison people like this and you continue to take people's choices away from them, this actually has ramifications for the political system as well, which I thought was a fascinating, you know, you know uh, thesis. I think that's our biggest takeaway, frankly, uh, that we certainly hadn't thought about the first time out. Um, you know, we did think about consolidation the first time, but did not see the total consequences of this consolidation. And they became never became more apparent than during the pandemic, where uh, Smithfield plant in Waterloo, Iowa, or all the meat packing plants. Tyson, uh, yeah, Waterloo. Yeah, Tyson and Waterloo, Smithfield, Colorado, that they, um, that basically they wanted to keep operating. They didn't want to lose their profit shares. Uh, and they ultimately wanted their workers to keep coming in. And they wrote a report for the president to sign uh, that uh, called the Defense Production Act. And the Defense Production Act was initially created to get companies to do something that they didn't want to do in the national interest during wartime or during crisis. Uh, an example would be, you know, a car company to make Jeeps or airplanes. Uh, and in this case, uh, the meat packers got the president to sign a bill to allow them to do what they wanted to do that was not necessarily in the workers and the national interest so they could keep making their profit. And it turned out that much of the meat from the Waterloo plant that we looked at was sent off to China. And they were saying, we need it to stay open to feed America. Uh, and. and and, oh, sorry. And it also wasn't even didn't even go through Congress to be a bill. It was just an executive order that Donald exactly. Trump signed. It was it, it was just like, you know, stating that, which is I, I think it's it's Schlosser also who 
sort of explains this, you know, really well in, in your movie that like, as you said, this is a perversion of the Defense Production Act where, you know, during the pandemic, we wanted people to, you know, uh, we wanted car companies and so forth to, to produce ventilators uh, and, and things like that, which they wouldn't normally uh, do. And this was just like, we want to keep operating in the way we do so we can send things to abroad right <laughs> not, not to not to the neighborhood uh, you know supermarkets and then <laughs> another example of that is we spoke with osha workers who are sent in by the federal government to regulate these plants and uh at the time when these workers were going into the uh the meatpacking plants and they didn't have masks and it was a total vector for spreading the virus uh the osha workers were being told don't wear masks because it will set a bad example. Uh, they were not allowed. It was the meatpacking companies that didn't allow them to wear masks in their place, uh, in their workplace, uh, or discouraged. I don't know. Uh, we were told that they, you know, despite their desire to wear masks, they were told they couldn't, and a number of them died in the process. And it was the power of these companies that could get the federal government to do what they wanted. Uh, and again, that is an example of the corruption uh, of our democracy by these powerful corporations. Let's let's talk a little bit about you know the the event last night because I I mean I I've, I've as you can probably imagine from somebody who uh, has a podcast in Washington about politics and I do a lot of stuff with documentaries I've been to a decent number of these. Uh, I was not prepared for the uh, some of the star wattage. I mean, like, you know, like for things like this, you usually get like, you know, a couple here or there. And and then, you know, for, you know, for a, a, a movie about food policy, you had the requisite people from the environmental working group and, you know, other food, uh, you know, food centered or agriculture or trade centered nonprofits and, and, and so forth. Uh, and and those folks were all there, but then you also had Ann Hornaday, the chief film critic of the Washington Post. Uh, you had uh, uh, Mark Cuban. <laughs> so, some people have heard of him, uh, you know, the uh, Dallas Mavericks owner and and Shark Tank and uh, you know entrepreneur uh, and also an initial uh, investor in in my the parent the parent company that owns Roll Call uh, Fiscal Note. Uh, you, the, you know, United States senators uh, in, in uh, Cory Booker and, and John Tester and Raphael Warnock, uh, who was there also. Uh, and then you had Chris Tucker, <laughs> you know, of, of uh, Rush Hour and Friday's fame. Uh, you had Morgan Freeman. I mean, it, it just kind of kept going. And I, I mean, I've been in that Burke Theater a couple of times where it gets kind of tight. This was quite literally standing room only uh, for for this. Were you what was going through your your heads when you when you saw that, like, oh, this this is, there's a lot going on here. This is not a small theater either. This happens to Melissa and I all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it was a thrilling screening, honestly. Um, it was such a fantastic mix of people. A lot of um, participants from the film were there and seeing people from so many different arenas come together around this issue just tells you how um, much people care about food and um, you know what it means to us, and so it was it was really a thrilling screening. When you uh, when when we'll when this podcast goes live and we'll we'll send you the uh, the link and and I'm sure you'll subscribe and, and so forth after that after <laughs> yeah. hearing. Uh, but our our intro uh, it has a little you know music and it's it, we I literally have a, a you know the tagline for the podcast is you know uh, how how politics and, and, and pop culture, you know, interact. And, and I, and this was about the, as perfect a nexus of that as, as I can imagine. I really was not expecting Morgan Freeman to show up <laughs> that I could have predicted a few of the other people. And then also weirdly, I mean, you know, people are different people, different celebrities will show up to a reception and they'll leave and they'll come back and maybe they'll leave early. Chris Tucker <laughs> sat next to Raphael Warnock in the theater, not just through the movie, but also through the Q&A, too, which I mean, the Q&A didn't la it lasted until, you know, well after 10, 10, 30 p.m., which is, you know, th this is a this is a chewy subjects, too. This isn't just like a, you know, the comedy stand up routine kind of thing. This was you guys are talking like, you know, about antitrust law <laughs> and, and food distribution and, you know, uh, chemistry and stuff like that. This was a, about as successful a meeting of the minds and interests as I've, I've seen in a long time. 
you know, yesterday we spent uh, the day going around Washington. We went to the um, FDA and met with them because they are talking about trying to get labeling laws that reflect the laws that have been put into place in Chile and Mexico and Canada uh, that we talk about in our film, where if an item has too much sugar, salt or fat, uh, it can no longer have a health claim to it. Uh, and generally, most of the items in the supermarket that have health claims are unhealthy items. Uh, you know, broccoli doesn't have a health claim, but, you know, Cocoa Puffs might. Um, so, <laughs> you know, and we're saying, you know, this has to stop. And it stopped in these other countries with labeling. And, you know, cigarettes have been a perfect example where you put a label on it. Uh, and in that case, they taxed it. We're not saying to tax this food. We're saying to just let people know what's in their food and let them, you know, be aware of the consequences of this food. Um, and in talking to the FDA, you realize they need support uh, to get this through. It's a pretty divided Congress, to say the least, at this moment in time. Um, and they need all the support they can get because I think there'll be, you know, there will be some Republicans who do want to know what's in their food. Uh, that was certainly the case with the first Food Inc. Um, you know, maybe it's become more of a culture, food's become more of a culture war and we, you know, want to celebrate our uh, hamburgers and whatever now. But I, cream, cream and mushroom flavored Pringles. I didn't yeah, know that existed yeah, until bacon, I saw your film. <laughs> yeah, when we started doing this film, Eric Schlosser sent me the Baconator Pringles. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so before I let you go, um, cause I know you have a busy schedule. We've got, got a couple of other appearances before, uh, um, you know, you get a little bit of a rest. The film starts streaming on, uh, uh, Friday, uh, correct. Uh, uh, April 12th and on what platforms? Well, it's video on demand on this video Friday. It goes on to Hulu in August. In August. Oh, but okay. it's available Friday anywhere you can get a movie, uh, on demand. Okay. And, and I would uh, just based again, uh, you know, Washington is a, a unique uh, film uh, kind of place, but we had, you know, I think three other screenings uh, scheduled in this pr the previous evening to this podcast. So I wouldn't be surprised if it pops up in some, uh, at least in some art house uh, places, places that show the screen documentaries on, on a fairly consistent basis, uh, but video on, on demand and then later this summer uh, on Hulu. Uh, Robert, Melissa, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on on landing the film. There is a lot there. Um, and, and again, it's uh, it's w well worth uh, folks' time if they're at all interested in food, which I think that applies to just about almost everybody. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you.